Well, are you ready to get into y'all's Word today? All right, I want you to open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 20. We're going to begin in just a moment with verse 17. And I've entitled this message today, Contending for the Original Apostolic Belief. Now, I'm not going to go into a long uh, introduction here. I'm just going to allow the Scripture to speak for itself. So Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 17. This is Luke, who is the author of the book of Acts, and he's writing here in this portion about the travels of Paul. And from Miletos, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the assembly. So Paul has called for the elders of the assembly in Ephesus. And when they'd come to him, they said to, he said to them, you know, from the first day that I came to Asia, how I was with you all the time, serving the master with all humility, with many tears and trials, which befell me by the plotting of the Yehudim, the Jews, as I kept back no matter that was profitable, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, witnessing to Yehudim, to the Jews, and also to Greeks, repentance toward Elohim, in other words, turning from sin, which is the transgression of the Torah, to Elohim, and belief in our master, Yeshua Messiah, verse 22. And now see, I go bound in the spirit to Yerushalayim. All right, it's the will of Yah in the spirit. That's what he's talking about. Not knowing what is going to meet me there, except that the spirit, the set apart spirit, witnesses in every city saying that chains and pressures await me. So he knows he's going to be imprisoned and persecuted. He doesn't know all the details, but he knows by the Spirit that he's going to be imprisoned and persecuted. Verse 24, but I do not count my life of any value to me. In other words, I'm willing to forfeit my own life. That's what he means by that. So that I might accomplish my mission with joy. Such a powerful passage for all of us who are serious about accomplishing our mission. Paul said, I'm willing to forfeit my life to accomplish my mission, and I'm going to do it with joy. Hallelujah. And the service, or the ministry, which I received from the Master Yeshua, to bear witness to the good news of the favor of Elohim. So, I find it interesting that Paul is so powerfully enthusiastic about sharing the good news of the favor of Elohim, about taking to all the world the wonderful good news of redemption that's come through the death of Yeshua on the tree. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9, and I believe that Paul was sorry that he persecuted the assembly, and it appears that he regrets that very deeply, and that's a key to why he worked so hard. I think a lot of people are that way. We we believe in redemption. We want to redeem our lives for the good when we've discovered that we've done something in error, and I think that dynamic was at work in, in Paul's life. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. Paul said, for I am the least of the emissaries. I'm the least of the apostles. Well, none of us would say that about Paul, would we? Most of us think he's the premier apostle, you know, but, but Paul in his own thinking, he saw himself as the least of the emissaries who am not worthy to be called an emissary. Why? Because I persecuted the assembly of Elohim. See, he realized that and that, that stuck with him in my opinion. It stuck with him all his life. And I think it was a factor in why he worked so hard, why he worked so diligently to spread the good news of redemption. Amen. How many of you are glad to be redeemed? Praise Yah. Well, that ought to inspire us as well. Look at verse 10. But by the favor of Elohim, I am what I am. And his favor toward me was not in vain. But I labored much more than they all. Yet not I, but the favor of Elohim with me. And so I believe he was inspired, motivated, empowered to labor as he did in the good news because of his thanksgiving 
toward the Almighty for redeeming him and using him and really placing a value on his life that he felt like wasn't deserved. How many of you could say that's your testimony? I know it's not. It's mine. Amen. So go back to Acts chapter 20 and verse 25. And now see, I know that you all, among whom I went about preaching the reign of Elohim, shall see my face no more. This is a bit of a sad moment, actually. He's with these, with these men, these elders that he's worked amongst for some time and developed a relationship with. And he's letting them know, you're not going to see me again. Verse 26, therefore I witness to you this day that I am clear from the blood of all. Now, this is a, an important passage, and a lot of times we just read right over it, and we don't understand why Paul is saying that. Uh, Paul was very familiar with the Scripture, and so he's making a reference here to Ezekiel. All right, I'm going to show you that here in just a moment. Let's read verse 26 again. Therefore I witness to you this day that I am clear from the blood of all, for I kept not back from declaring to you all the counsel of Elohim. Okay, this is a clear reference to a passage that's found in Ezekiel. There's actually several in Ezekiel, but I'm just going to I'm going to take you to one. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 18. It says, "When I say to the wrong, you shall certainly die, and you have not warned him nor spoken to warn the wrong from his wrong way to save his life, that same wrong man shall die in his crookedness and his blood I require at your hand. But if you have worn the wrong and he does not turn from his wrong nor from his wrong way, he shall die in his crookedness and you have delivered your being. So Paul's saying, man, I have preached. I have made it clear what's right and wrong in the Messiah. I have labored among you. I have not withheld any of the full counsel of the Almighty, and my hands are clean. There's no blood on my hands. That's what he's saying there. Look at verse 28 of Acts chapter 20. Therefore, take heed to yourselves. Now he's going to charge these shepherds. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the set-apart spirit has made you overseers, in other words, take my example. Do just like I did. Preach the full counsel to your flock. To shepherd the assembly of Elohim, which he has purchased with his own blood. Declare the full counsel of Elohim to the flock. Verse 29. This is so important. And this is what I was talking about when I said we must contend for the original apostolic belief. For I know this. Now this is Paul speaking prophetically. That after my departure... All right, and I believe he's making reference here to his death because he says in another place he talks about his death being a departure. That after my departure, savage wolves shall come in among you, not sparing the flock. So they're going to infiltrate from the outside. He says, when I, when I die, when I depart, something tragic is going to happen in the assembly. He's telling these these shepherds to be careful and to keep an eye open because this will happen. He doesn't say it might happen. He says it will happen. And it's going to happen just shortly after he departs. Okay, now why am I making this point? Because I want you to see that the apostasy of religion began early on. It's not just something that happens at the very end. We're seeing Paul saying to these elders in Ephesus that shortly after I depart, savage wolves are going to come in not sparing the flock. There's going to be some damage that's going to happen to the assembly. All right? The apostasy begins. The falling away. These wolves who, who are coming in and they're not sparing the flock of Yah. Okay? Verse 30. Also from among yourselves or from inside the body. So it's going to happen from the outside. It's also going to happen from the inside. Men shall arise speaking distorted teachings. All right. Now, if we're paying attention, we know there's a lot of distorted teaching going on right now. But, but Paul was saying shortly after I depart, it's going to start. 
because Paul was teaching what Yeshua taught. And I'm going to show you a passage. I showed it to you last week where Paul said, if anyone teaches differently or if someone teaches something that disagrees with Yeshua, withdraw from that person. You see how he's warning the fact that after he departs, the savage wolves are going to come in and, and they're going to teach things that are different from Yeshua and they're going to teach things that disagree with Yeshua. And Paul tells us the sound words, the sound doctrine comes from Yeshua. All right, he doesn't say anything about religion. As a matter of fact, he says to be careful about religion. Yeshua never said follow religion. He said follow me. So what's happening today in the spirit? There are people who are coming out of all kinds of religious backgrounds, the different denominations, and they're receiving revelation from the spirit that we're to follow Yeshua. And that's what matters. We're to love what he loved and hate what he hated. We're to say what he said and do what he did. We're to walk in his ways. Before you can walk in his ways, you have to discover his ways. And I can tell you, Without any hesitation, his ways are not the ways of religion. As a matter of fact, if you study Yeshua, you'll find out that he was constantly chastising religious leaders because they loved their religious traditions more than they loved the written truth. And Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the scripture says the Torah is the way, the truth, and the life. He said, their burdens... The burden of religion, those burdens are heavy burdens, hard to bear. He's contrasting the burden of religion with the burden of the Torah. He says, but come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden with religion, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. See, there is a yoke, folks. Perverted grace says there's no yoke. You get all the blessings, but you have no personal responsibility. I call that the doctrine of personal irresponsibility. That's saying there is no yoke, but Yeshua said there is a yoke. He said, take my yoke. It's the yoke of the, of the word. Take it upon yourself. Learn from me. Learn from the word. For I am gentle and lowly, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is not heavy burdens hard to bear. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen? So, so what is this movement? It's getting back to the scripture. It's getting back to Yeshua. It's discovering his ways and Walking in them. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Look at verse 28 again. Therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the set apart spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the assembly of Elohim. In other words, make sure that they stay in the original apostolic belief which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves shall come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, from within the body, men shall arise speaking distorted teachings. Why? To draw away the taught ones or the disciples after themselves. These are teachers that want a following. See, if you're in the ministry to create a following... You have a perverted understanding of ministry. You're not to get people to follow you. You're to get people to follow Yeshua. It's not your job to get people to follow religion or your denomination. But we see that all the time in religion, do we not? As a minister, it is our responsibility to charge people to follow Yeshua, to learn about his ways and to walk in his ways. And we will be judged for whether or not we accomplish that well. If it's all about you, if it's all about your church, so to speak, amen, if it's all about your denomination, that's a perverted way of thinking. Get people to follow Yeshua. Can you say amen? amen. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 3, this is the verse that I or the passage that I referenced just a moment ago, Paul said this, if anyone teaches differently and does not agree to the sound words, who has the sound words? Those of our master, Yeshua Messiah, and to the teaching which is according to reverence. 
He is puffed up. He's proud and arrogant. He understands nothing at all. He's sick about questionings and verbal battles from which come envy, strife, slander, wicked suspicions, worthless disputes of men of corrupt minds and deprived of the truth who think that reverence is a means of gain. In other words, ministry is a way to make money. Who think that reverence is a means of gain. What does he say about these people? Withdraw from such. And this is a charge. This is something the Spirit's placed in my heart that I'm going to keep preaching from the housetops. If you're anywhere in a setting where the preacher's preaching about himself or preaching about just his church or a denomination and the focus is on someone or something other than Yeshua, withdraw from such. If it feels like it's about making money, withdraw from such. That's why we offer our Sukkot. And there's no strategy whatsoever for making money. We don't believe in making money with the holy days of Yah. That's just our belief. Can you say amen? amen? Acts chapter 20, verse 31. Therefore, watch, remembering that for three years, night and day, I did not cease to warn each one with tears. So Paul warned about the apostasy, the the falling away of the assembly that would begin shortly after his death. And I'm hopeful by showing you scripture today that you're going to to gain an understanding, maybe a new understanding, that if you're thinking that the falling away is going to happen sometime in the future, you're partially right. Because there will be a great falling away at the time of the revealing of the anti-Messiah. But I want you to see from Scripture that the authors of the apostolic writings were saying that the apostasy was beginning in their day. So if it was happening then, can you imagine what the environment might look like today after 2,000 years of it? That's my main point today. So many of us were born in religion. We were raised in religion. We felt good about our religion. We had confidence in religion. We thought we were right in our religion. We thought everybody else was wrong in their religion. But now we've come to the place where we have to question religion. Because we've discovered the apostasy is not sometime in the future only. It started back in the first century. Paul said, when I pass, when I depart, savage wolves are going to come in from the outside and from the inside, trying to destroy the flock. And believe me, it happened then. And it's happened for 2,000 years. And it's still happening today. That's why we have to open our eyes and think clearly. We have to be willing to resist religion, test everything, discover the truth, and walk in the ways of Yeshua, because he's coming back for his own, for his bride, who's made herself ready. Amen? Here's another of Paul's warnings. Here's a warning that he gave to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. This is... Such a powerful charge. I want you to see the emphasis that Paul places on this charge. He says, in the sight of Elohim, I mean before Yah, and the Master Yeshua Messiah, who shall judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His reign, I earnestly charge you. So you're being charged before the Almighty, before the Messiah, the one who's going to judge the living and the dead at his return, this is the charge that's coming to you, okay? Now, he's charging Timothy, but we can take the charge upon ourselves. What does he say? Your Bible may say, preach the word. Mine says, proclaim the word. And there's an exclamation point there in my translation. 
So what's the big charge before the Almighty, before the Messiah, before the one who's going to judge the living and the dead when he arrives? The charge is preach the word. Now, I can't imagine Paul thinking that preaching the word is telling a bunch of life experiences and using the word as an example for your life experience. We, we see a lot of that these days. It's become entertainment in a lot of ways. And people choose what congregation, what assembly they're going to attend by how well entertained they are. And yet the scripture itself tells us what we're to preach. It says proclaim the word. Shaul being someone who had memorized much of the Torah, to be a student of Gamaliel, you had to have a very strong handle on the scriptures. If somebody like that says, preach the word, what do you think he means? When the Holy Spirit says, preach the word, what do you think he means? And you have chosen to sit under a ministry where we bring the word. And why do we bring the word? Because we take seriously the charge. It's the word that changes lives. Not entertainment. Our stories. I'm not saying that you can't use a life experience to bolster and and help support and help get into the minds of people the principle that you're teaching from the word. But you better be teaching the word. Can you say a good amen? Amen. Proclaim the word. Be urgent in season and out of season. Tickle their ears. Make them feel good. Say what they want to hear so they'll come back. Is that what it says? It doesn't say that, but it seems like some people are reading it that way. What does it say? Convict. Warn. Appeal. With all patience and teaching. Now, here's the warning. For there shall be a time when they shall not bear sound teaching. In other words, they're not going to receive sound teaching. Now, what did Paul say about sound teaching? Who who gives sound teaching? Yeshua. They're not going to want to receive what Yeshua taught. They're going to take a twisted version of Paul's writings and make it say what they want it to say. And they're going to say Yeshua was under the law and he taught people under the law. We're not under the law. So what he said doesn't apply to us. But Paul never said that. Are you following me? For there shall be a time when they shall not bear sound teaching. But according to their own desires, they shall heap up for themselves teachers tickling the ear. They're going to have their favorite teachers. All right, the ones that make them feel good, the ones that say what they want them to say. And they shall indeed turn their ears away from the truth. Now, what does the scripture say is truth? The Torah is truth. All right, read Psalm 119.1. Read other passages in Psalm 119. You'll find out over and over and over again. The Torah is truth. Okay, And they shall indeed turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to myths, untruths. Just because it's it's accepted doesn't make it true. See, broad is a way that leads to destruction, and there are many who find it. Just because the many believe it doesn't make it true. Narrow and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So who's going to be right? The many or the few? Welcome to the few. Now, that doesn't mean that we have a small mentality as as it relates to 
sharing the, the good news, we have an all the world, every creature mentality. We're to go forward believing that all the world and every creature will receive. And we cannot be discouraged when they don't. So we preach like they will. And we don't get discouraged when they don't. Some will. Amen? Amen. All right, quickly, we're talking about Paul sounding the alarm to Timothy, saying that they're not going to bear sound teaching, but according to their own desires, they're going to heap up for themselves teachers, tickling the ear, and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to myths. Is there any other place in the scripture where we might find that principle taught? Isaiah prophesied the exact same thing. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8, let's look at it really quickly. And go, write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it on a scroll that it is for a latter day a witness forever, verse 9, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who refuse to hear the Torah of Yah, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right, speak to us what is smooth. In other words, what's attractive to the ears. Prophesy deceits or proclaim lies. Turn aside from the way. What is the way? Psalm 119.1, blessed are the perfect in the way who walk in the Torah of Yah. Swerve from the path. Cause the set apart one of Israel to cease from before us. Okay, Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, but your crookednesses have separated you from your Elohim and your sins have hidden his face from you from hearing Jeremiah 5 verse 31 says the prophets have prophesied falsely and the priests rule by their own hand and my people have loved it so see you're in the wrong crowd when you're loving false prophecy when you're loving what the religious leaders are doing and it doesn't line up with the word you're talking about oh how wonderful your assembly is and how great the pastor is and and all of the things that you think are wonderful the question is is your assembly and your pastor lining up with scripture and that's the test you will know them by what they say. Is that what it says? You will know them by their fruit. See, we're all called to be fruit inspectors. Well, see, our society today says, you know, people say, don't judge me. Don't judge me. And even the body of Messiah has bought in to that. To where you can't even, in, in most assemblies, make a righteous judgment about something. Because you're going to be accused of judging people. Yeshua never taught against a righteous judgment. He taught against being judgmental, fault finding, picking constantly at people, looking for something wrong. And he says, you're not even qualified to help those people with their speck until you get your plank out of your eye. You're a hypocrite. This is not a teaching against righteous judgment, folks. We're supposed to make righteous judgment. If you don't make righteous judgment, you will be deceived. Because in these last days, it's not that light and darkness are going to be so contrasted that you're going to be able to see clearly the difference, it's the deception that's going to become so great to where it's difficult to make an appropriate judgment. And people are going, to, are going to call good evil 
and evil good. And society is going to accept it. And many in the, quote, church are going to go along with it. We have to make righteous judgments. We have to be fruit inspectors. Can you say amen? But you may not be qualified to make a righteous judgment if you never read the scripture. I don't want you sitting as a judge over me if you don't even know the scripture. Amen? Now, I'm obviously not talking to anybody in this congregation. I must be talking to somebody else in some other assembly. Amen? It's time to grow up in the scripture, folks. That's what I'm talking about. We've got to be mature. These days are getting so dark and the deception is getting so great that if we don't mature in the scripture and in a relationship with the spirit, we're going to run the risk of being deceived. Amen. Look at Romans chapter 16, verse 18. Paul said, for such ones do not serve our master Yeshua, Messiah, but their own stomach. So these are, these are people who are serving their own lusts and by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the innocent like an innocent baby. It's really talking about the immature. If you're immature, you can be deceived with smooth words, flattering speech. So it's time to grow up. Matthew 7, verse 15, Yeshua said, But beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. There's that deception I was talking about. And it's from within. But inwardly they are savage wolves. By their fruits you shall know them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every good tree yields good fruit, but a rotten tree yields wicked fruit. A good tree is unable to yield wicked fruit, and a rotten tree to yield good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, by their fruits you shall know them. All right, now, verse 21 is right on the heels of verse 20. So we've got to read them in the same context. He says, not everyone who says to me. See, you got to watch out for what they say. Because they're going to say one thing and then do something else. Do not be deceived by what they say. Watch what they do. Watch what they do. Not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, shall enter into the reign of the heavens, but he who is, what? Doing the desire of my Father in the heavens. What is doing the desire of my Father? How do we learn the desire of the Father? In the Torah, we, we learn His will. He makes it plain to us. So this scripture says those that are obeying the scripture. Not cherry picking it, picking out the ones we want to obey and forgetting about the rest of it. Not saying, well, I just live out of this little sliver in the back of the book. If we don't have a foundation in Torah, we don't even know how to interpret the back of the book. Amen? So Yeshua said we've got to be doing the will of Abba Father. Amen? Verse 22, many shall say to me in that day. So they're still talking. And they're hoping that they're going to be able to convince the judge of the living and the dead by what they say. He's not hearing what they say. He's looking at what they do, what they did in their lives. Many shall say to me in that day, Master, Master. See, they're declaring him Master. Your Bible may say Lord. Have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? See, this is all the flashy stuff. All right. False prophets prophesy in his name, too. 
And even those seven sons of, of Sceva, you know, you had these itinerant Jewish rabbis that were going around trying to cast out and cast it out some demons. I mean, you can intimidate some demons if you yell loud enough because there's different levels of demons. And it says that they will say, we did marvelous works, mighty works in your name. So does that convince him? And then I shall declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. All right? You who lived like there was no Torah. You who disobeyed the written scripture. And you said that you prophesied my name. You said you cast out demons. You said you did wonderful ministry works. But I'm going to look beyond what you say. I'm going to look at what you really did in your life. You lived like there was no Torah. You followed religion. And I don't know you. See, we have to have a deep, personal, intimate relationship with the King of Kings and the Master of Masters. We have to be willing to discover his ways and walk in his ways. He's coming back for his own, the one he knows. And he only knows you when you've spent time with him. He's not going to walk in Roman ways, folks. Well, I, I thought I walked with you all those years. Focused on religion. How many of you want to run that risk? You want to follow religion and hope. He doesn't say, depart from me, I never knew you. Anybody want to run that risk? Mm -mm. We want to discover his ways and walk with him in his ways. Amen. All right, another quick scripture, Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 44. Yeshua said, the son of Adam shall send out his messengers or his angels and they shall gather out of his reign or his kingdom all the stumbling blocks, all the causes of sinning and offense and those doing lawlessness. Okay, he's referencing Zephaniah 1.3. Those doing lawlessness. Notice it doesn't say anything about a mental ascension that he's Messiah. That's what religion says. That's all, all you need to do is just mentally ascend that he's Messiah. No, he, he says himself, you, you need to do righteousness and not do lawlessness. So he's going to send out his angels. They're going to gather out of his kingdom all the stumbling blocks and those doing lawlessness and shall throw them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous... The righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the reign of their father. That's a reference to Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. He who has ears, let him hear. He's saying the same thing today. Who has ears? Who will hear this message? This message is going to run contrary to those who are tickling the ears. This message is going to run contrary to religious teachers. No matter how sincere they might be in their own thinking. He who has an ear, let him hear. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying. You know, it's way past time for us to wake up. And stop following religion. Malachi chapter 3, verse 18. Then you shall again see the difference between the righteous and the wrong. There is a difference. Between one who serves Elohim. How do you serve him? Through obedience. And one who does not serve him. He 
Here's a very revealing passage, Revelation chapter 22, beginning with verse 14. Yeshua said this, Blessed are those doing His commands, so that the authority shall be theirs under the tree of life, and to enter through the gates into the city. But outside are the dogs, and those who enchant with drugs, and those who whore, and the murderers, and the idolaters, and all who love to do falsehood. Blessed are those doing Yah's commands, so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life. How many of you want to eat of the tree of life? Well, it's made clear right here how to have authority to do so. Obey the commandments. And to enter through the gates into the city. How many of you want to enter into the city? How do you have the authority to enter into the city? Obey the commands. But outside of the city are the dogs. Those who enchant with drugs. Those who whore. The murderers. The idolaters. And all those who love and do falsehood. So this is describing those who disobey the commandments. Because there's a commandment against those things. All right. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to finish up that passage. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll pick up at verse 5. Paul wrote, But you be sober in all matters. Suffer hardships. Do the work of an evangelist. He's charging Timothy to do these things. Accomplish your service completely. For I am already being poured out, and the time of my what? My departure, my death, has arrived. I have fought the good fight. Paul is following Yeshua. And Paul said to be able to follow Yeshua, I had to fight a good fight. And if you're going to follow Yeshua, you're going to have to fight the good fight. Religion tries to make it easy for everybody. You get all the goodies. You don't have any personal responsibility. One of the most popular messages floating around today, the perverted grace message. You get it all because... Yah has put himself into a corner and called himself love, so he has to love everybody the same way at all times. So you get all the goodies, even if you've rejected him. You have no personal responsibility, because then, if you actually do anything, you've fallen from grace, and now you're into law-keeping. I say this a lot. You probably know the answer by now. But if you're not a law keeper, what are you? A law breaker. He said, I fought the good fight. If you're going to walk with Yeshua, you're going to fight a good fight. It's a good fight. But you will fight. I have finished the race. How many of you want to be able to say at some point, I finished my race? I have guarded the belief. That's what this message is all about today. You're going to have to guard the belief. Because religion wants to steal it. Your friends and neighbors and co-workers want to try to talk you out of it. Your former pastor wants to accuse you of being heretical. All of those in your social circle are plotting and planning an intervention. (laughs) See, it's funny, but some of us know how real that is. You're going to have to guard the belief, but it's not religious belief. It's the original 
apostolic belief that came from Yeshua and his set-apart emissaries. I have guarded the belief. If you want to finish your race with joy, you have to guard the belief. For the rest, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the master, the righteous judge, shall give to me on that day, and not to me only, this is a good part, but also to all those loving his appearing. How many of you are loving his appearing? We're living for that day. Not so that we could have some mythological escape, but so that we could be a part of the establishment of his kingdom on earth and walk with him as his bride and rule and reign this earth for a thousand years of Shabbat, of Shalom. Hallelujah. How many of you believe you can endure anything if you know that's the, going to be the outcome of your faith, your belief? Well, I'm going to take on one more, although I have two more. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. So the Apostle John warns the believers. My little children, I write this to you so that you do not sin. What is sin? Transgression of the Torah. And if anyone sins, we have an intercessor. Your Bible may say advocate. With the Father, Yeshua Messiah, a righteous one. And he himself is an atoning offering for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for all the world. And by this we know that we know Him. So this is the litmus test. How many of you ever studied chemistry? You remember that little list, litmus strip that you'd put in that chemical to see what color it turned? Do you want to know if you know Him? By this we know that we know Him. Here it is. If we guard His commands. Now, is this the Brit Hadashah? Yes, it is. I usually don't answer people, but... <laughs> <laughs> the Apostolic Writings. Okay? So here it is in the Apostolic Writings that says, if you want to know, if you know Him, how do you know it? If you obey His commands. That's how you know that you know Him. Verse 4, the one who says, I know him, and does not guard or obey his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, is this not speaking to religious folks? Religious folks say, I know him. Well, I know him. And the congregation I go to, we, we know him. The litmus test is, are you obeying his commands? If you say you know him and you don't obey his commands, the scripture says. Now, see, if I just preach that, people say, I tell you what, that preacher preaches hard. <laughs> he called everybody that didn't obey the commands a liar. No, I didn't. The scripture did. I'm just. <laughs> the one who says, I know him and does not guard or obey his commands is a liar. And the truth's not in him. But whoever guards his word. Truly the love of Elohim, or you could say our love for Elohim, has been perfected in him. Remember what Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So our love for Elohim is perfected in the fact that we obey his commands. By obeying his commands, you're expressing your love for him. By obeying his commands, you're perfecting the love that you have for him. Verse 6, the one who says he stays 
in him. Your Bible may say abides in him, in Yeshua. Ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. If you say you abide in Yeshua, you ought to walk. This says even as. You could say just as. If you're truly abiding in him, you're walking just as he walked. And you're not making excuses for his ways. You're not trying to decide what part of his ways that you're willing to walk in and what part of his ways you think you don't need to walk in anymore. I mean, he kept the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. Are you someone who wants to follow in his ways or are you making a religious excuse and calling it Sunday or any day? Now, you've heard sincere preachers, I, I assume they're sincere, say, well, my, my Sabbath is on Monday. Because they've taken the commandment and boiled it down to a religious principle that it's just a time of rest. But if you change it to any other day, you mess up the prophetic picture that the Almighty has designed for it to represent. Six days of human history. A day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. After the sixth day comes the seventh day. The seventh day is Shabbat. When Yeshua comes back after 6,000 years of human history, he's going to establish his sabbatical kingdom. 1,000 years of shalom. If you move it to Monday, you've just destroyed the picture. If you move it to Sunday, you've just destroyed the picture. He never said it's any day you decide it to be. That makes you Elohim, not him. He says it's on the seventh day. Well, we're talking about walking in the ways of Yeshua. Yeshua kept the festivals because all the festivals speak of him. Yeshua never kept a Roman holiday. Why? Because he didn't follow religion, folks. He says to us, follow me, because he doesn't want us following religion. So you need to praise Yah every day that he's given you ears to hear and eyes to see, and you've been delivered from religion. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. All right. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. We're going to wind up here in just a moment. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Do not love the world, nor that which is in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Well, what is the love of the Father? How do you love the Father? Through obedience. If you love the world, do you think you're going to be obeying the Father? You're going to be obeying your own lusts. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's loving the world. If you love the world, you are not loving the Father. In other words, you're not obeying the commandments. To love the world is to disobey the commandments. Can you say amen? Are you following me? Now, if you, if you grasp this, this passage, which you've read probably a hundred times, will have a much greater meaning. Do not love the world is don't obey your own lusts. Obey the commandments. Do not love the world, nor that which is in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, again, you could trace it all the way back to the garden, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away. So do you want to follow the world? If you follow the world, you're going to end up where the world goes. The world passes away. Okay? The world passes away and the lust of it. 
Here it is. But the one who mentally ascends that Yeshua is the Messiah. Is that what it says? No. What does it say? But the one doing the desire of Elohim remains forever. How do you discover the desire of Elohim? You read the Torah. You obey the Torah. Then you're doing the desire of Elohim. So this is a promise of eternal life. Now, you can't just obey the Torah apart from believing in Yeshua. That was the problem that the Jews in those days had. They wanted just to obey the Torah and not believe in Yeshua. That was a great challenge that Paul was constantly dealing with in his writings. You have to understand that to be able to interpret Paul correctly. All right. But if you believe in Yeshua, the living Torah, then you will be obeying Yeshua, the living Torah. Amen? Your belief, if it's a living belief, produces obedience. You remember how we've talked about the covenant? We have a covenant with, with Yah through Yeshua. His part of the covenant is to answer our prayers, to fulfill His promises. Our side of the covenant is to have a belief that produces obedience. If you have a belief that doesn't produce obedience, your belief is dead. And a dead belief cannot produce a living salvation. It can produce religion. All right, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour. So here's the Apostle John. He's saying, he's sensing that we're in the last hour. So the latter days is the 2,000 year period after the ascension of Yeshua. He realized that. It is the last hour. And as you have heard that the anti-Messiah is coming. Well, Paul taught about the anti-Messiah, the one that would come at the very end. Right? And you, he's saying you've heard that that anti-Messiah is coming. But notice the next two words. Even now. So, so when did this mystery of lawlessness begin? Is it somewhere in the future or was it right then? Right then. Again, my point being, if the apostasy started back then, if the false teachers were teaching back then, if the people wanted their ears tickled back then, if religion was being established back then, what does it look like now after 2,000 years? I wonder how many preach this kind of message in their assemblies or will this weekend. We have to follow the Spirit, don't we? You've heard that the anti-Messiah is coming. Even now, men, many anti-Messiahs have come. Those who teach differently and in disagreement with Yeshua's teachings. The anti-Messiahs. All right. This is how we know that it is the last hour when all these anti-Messiahs come, people that are teaching differently, people that are teaching in disagreement with Yeshua, you're in the last hour. They went out from us. See, there was a falling away, an apostasy. But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have stayed with us. But in order that it might be made manifest that none of them were of us, verse 20, and you have an anointing from the set apart one, and you know all. All right, now this is, this is John speaking to all of our highest potentials, because we do have that potential. If you're willing to submit to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he's the spirit of truth, and he will lead you in all truth, if you believe that, all right? Verse 20, and you have an anointing from the set-apart one, and you know all. I did not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no falsehood is of the truth. 
Who is the liar except the one denying that Yeshua is the Messiah? This is the anti-Messiah, the one denying the Father and the Son. No one denying the Son has the Father. The one confessing the Son has the Father as well. So this is referencing some believing Jews who fell away and denied Yeshua as Messiah. And of course, the majority of Jews in Judaism have refused to believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. But this is also talking about non-Jewish believers who fall away from the original belief delivered by Yeshua and his apostles. And they've embraced paganism and the false doctrines of the Roman church. So you've got to see it both ways. You've got to see it on both sides. You've got those who have, who have denied Yeshua because of the religion of Judaism, or those maybe that believed at one point and then fell away. But then you also have those who are non-Jews in religion, who are not walking in Yeshua, in Yeshua's ways. They've created some new Yeshua. They've created a, a new Messiah and they've, they've couched him in paganism and the ways of Rome. It's true. You might as well say amen. <laughs> and so there's been a falling away after 2,000 years of religion being established. We don't even see hardly the one new man. That, that's, that's what brought me to the place where I am today was that I was reading in Ephesians about the one new man, this dynamic that was established through the blood of Messiah, where believing Jew and believing non-Jew worshipped hand in hand as one. That's what the blood of Messiah accomplished. The one new man. And the Spirit spoke to me and said, in your experience, have you seen the one new man? And my answer was, no, not in my experience. I haven't seen the one new man. I was raised up in religion on the Christian side. That's what I knew. And there were others that were raised up in religion on the Judaism side. But Yeshua came and died on the tree to pull down the wall of separation and to bring the believing Jew and the believing non-Jew together. The believing non-Jew has to leave paganism to be a part of the one new man. The believing Jew has to leave the traditions of men in Judaism. And we need to come together in the middle as the one new man. That's what this is all about. Look at verse 24. As for you, let that stay in you which you heard from the beginning. In other words, the, the original teachings of Yeshua and his emissaries. If what you heard from the beginning stays in you. See, this is contending for the original apostolic belief. You also shall stay in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He has promised us. What? Everlasting life. Verse 26, I have written this to you concerning those who lead you astray. I'm warning you about those that will lead you astray. You better open your eyes. You better open your ears. You better follow the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, or you have a great potential of being deceived. But the anointing which you have received from him, from Yeshua, stays in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as the same anointing does teach you, teach you concerning all and is true, he's the spirit of truth, and is no falsehood. And even as it has taught you, you stay in him. What does that mean? Follow Yeshua. Stay in Him. And now, little children, stay in Him so that when He appears, we might have boldness and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, and we do, 
you know that everyone doing righteousness, that's obeying the scriptures, has been born of him. We're going to close right there today. Uh, Next week, I'm going to pick up in Jude. Because as you know, Jude said, I wanted to write concerning our common deliverance, but I felt a necessity to write to you earnestly to contend for the belief. Amen. So we need to fight for the belief. We need to fight the good fight, as Paul said. Praise y'all. Amen. Hallelujah.